do it ourselves. Well, we are here, and we've been preparing for this for months, and we were here to look at this symposium not as a conference. This isn't a conference where we are offering expertise, where we are saying that this is the most innovative trend in our fields today. This is a gathering, an encuentro. This is an opportunity for us to share. And when we have our sessions and there are presenters, our presenters are storytellers. And our facilitators are there to cultivate connections, shared ideas, discover new opportunities, and possibly come up with plans and paradigm shifts. The vision of the symposium, of the Latinidades Art Symposium, is to do nothing less than to build a global network and alliance in which our arts professionals can support each other with resources, with friendship, with knowledge, so we can support our own communities where we live, throughout the world. This was an inspiration of a, of a speech in, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a, an assembly in Bogota, Colombia, last year, Patricia Arisa, she said, it is time for solidarity among international artists for planetary peace. And that is what we are here for. Sustainability means our survival. Not just our, not just the, our careers, but our survival. Survival through the arts. I want to, uh, I also want to acknowledge the process here is, is one of discovery. And I, I want to acknowledge that I'm really, I understood the importance of this when I decided to change the structure of the opening celebration because we made a discovery. And so I invite discoveries. We invite discoveries over the next three days that could change the direction of how we communicate, how you think about things. Uh, about two weeks ago, I came to a festival here, and uh, I ran into an old friend, and he was the first artist I met when I was hired as the artistic director of Academy of Theater in 2002. Don't do the math. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, in his studio was where we began to develop our new plays and test them in audiences in a studio apartment in Exposition. And uh, with a note card, he would work out the percentage of the ticket sales, 25%. And no matter how small or big the audiences were, the percentage was always the same. He was always content. I ran into him, and he said, uh, David, I have to show this to you. I have to show something to you. He showed me a video of something he was about to see. And what's important about it is that I was not aware of the event he filmed because I was busy creating pieces in the studio and I was concerned about, about learning how to connect with my audience. I didn't, I wasn't thinking I needed an art, a performing arts complex. I didn't advocate for one like I did, like I do now. But there was a movement of that. And this friend of mine caught this magical moment on so I'd like to bring Eduardo Ruiz to come to the stage and describe what he's about to show. Thank you, David. Uh, my name is Edward Ruiz, and uh, I'm an artist, and I grew up in Oak Cliff. And uh, in uh, 1994, I opened up my first art gallery here in Dallas. And I opened up, it evolved into an art venue. And I uh, opened up my doors to artists, musicians, performance groups, uh, just people that needed a home and a place to share their, uh, their art, their vision, and their ideas. Um, I was part of the local Dallas arts community. And uh, I worked with a lot of groups like Academia. Um, I was present here on the day of the groundbreaking ceremony. Um, I knew several artists that painted the shovels 
and that were part of the uh, the work that Betty did to uh, inspire a future place that I was just finding out about at the time. They were sort of elders for me, but they were part of our community. Uh, then, at that time, I realized how important this event was going to be, and so I made sure that I was here on that day. And I took it upon myself to bring a camera and, and document the good ceremony. Watching this footage brings back a lot of emotion. <laughs> it reminds me of how important the Cultural Center was going to be. I'm from a time before the Cultural Center. I knew that it would provide artists like myself to show their work. I knew the struggle of being an independent artist. And it brought me great joy to know that this place would be here. Thank you for letting me share this video with you. But it is a day that is that much sweeter because of the blood and the sweat and the tears and the efforts that have been made to bring this Latino Cultural Center to fruition. May 6th of 1995 was a very special day for me because it was the day I was elected as mayor the first time. But it was a special day for all of Dallas because the people of Dallas in overwhelming numbers committed major, major resources to going forward to making this center a reality. Even though I don't know that either of them are here, I want to extend a special thank you to former Dallas City Council members Chris Luna and Domingo Garcia, who worked very hard to get this item included on the bond program. And I want you to join me in expressing our gratitude. Our future shortly is unfolding before us, colored by the beautiful palette of Ricardo Lagaretta and enhanced by the beautiful brown faces 
millions of them that will come to that is theirs, that is ours. A thousand years of history will be reflected in this space. And it is for the future a thousand more years of our history. Because what this center will mean to this city will have an impact on our grandkids, on your kids, and hopefully their grandkids. Of our contribution to Dallas, Texas, to the state of Texas, and the United States. In 1987, I heard a saying, and I'll say it in Spanish, con ganas si se puede. Simply translated, it means with desire, you can do it. We want this cultural center to be used and to be supported. Not only by Latinos, but the entire citizens of Dallas. Thank you very much. Some people were missing in this video and from this presentation. Cora Cardona, yeah. founder, co founder of Capital Dallas. Yeah. The late Jeff Hurst. Yeah. And the late Jesse DeFi Senior. Oh. Three souls who were behind this movement to build a center for our Latino artists and large organizations here in Dallas. Also, who was very who was missing from this presentation was the city staff member, who was the primary driving force in making this reality. The, direct, the former director of the Office of Cultural Affairs, Margie Reese, who is here today. <laughs> Unfortunately, we had scheduled her to speak on a panel tomorrow, and so here she is to tell us about what you experienced watching the video. I'm not, uh, this isn't easy. 
I, I, I learned throughout my career uh, as an arts administrator to stay in the background. And so was, maybe that's part of the reason I got on the studio. Um, but it's okay. I want to talk to you a little bit today about this experience. Um, I, in my oh. talk, I'm sorry. What? Oh. Uh, I want to talk to you about visible invisibility. Um, you heard a little bit uh, on the tape about the background story, the origin story. I want to set a couple of pieces straight here. Um, this was not an act of passion. Uh, this facility came to be because it was part of a sidebar plan that was sitting aside a Dallas Cultural Master Plan that guided the development of the Dallas Arts District called the Sasaki Plan, which was adopted in 1983. And that plan was very futuristic. Um, it detailed what would become this corridor of cultural institutions for Dallas. In the process, the first time I became really awakened was when I was in the room in the conversation about that district, centered on the Cathedral of the Guadalupe, what to do with it, of all the arrogance, what to do with an iconic structure that dates back to 1902. That was the conversation, ladies and gentlemen. And I just uh, thought, what the fuck? <laughs> I was asked to do my job, to develop, to be on the panel, the committee, the team, to consider uh, the feasibility, a feasibility study was commissioned, 
and was successfully proven um, to, to develop then a Hispanic community cultural center. Am I right? Am I the <laughs> a community cultural center? Yes. Where we can get immunization, where we can have tutoring, where we can have after school programs for ESL classes and cultural expression. And I thought, oh, let's pass. No. <laughs> um, but as I began to get more and more in the process, I also began to understand that the community needed to trust us as a staff. And so in order to do that, I had the greatest team in the world, I will tell you today. Ronnie Jesse started building neighborhood touring programs, putting artists in communities and paying them to do that. Yolanda Alameda, who's staring at me now, I can't look at her because I like her a little week, drug me out to Oakland to some, some building that looked like it was going to fall apart an old ice house mm -hmm. and created a dynamic program for artists to have space to work in this dilapidated building. And we, we broke every rule in the book <laughs> to make it happen. That wasn't the last time. South Dallas Cultural Center is running. The African American Museum is built. The White House, we built the White House. The White Rock Lake Center uh, is, is, is rolling along, and so there were models to look at. And in my mind, even though I'm, I'm a fan to the day I died, the African American Center was designed by a white architect. And I thought to myself, I'll be damned if this Latino culture center is going to be designed by some white man. And I love white men. <laughs> <laughs> we're not doing that. I was on the committee and on the panel, and I raised that issue. Where are the artists of color, the Latino, the Mexican-American architects on this list? And I began quickly to learn that I should not ask questions, that there was a process, there was a list, there was a way that we do these things. And I said, can we open the process then to make sure that we're including the, the architects that reflect the culture? of the program that will be in this building. And I began to stalk Ricardo Leto. <laughs> I stalked him. I, there was no in Googling. <laughs> and I took my staff to Solana to see his work. And I thought, this is the kind, this is the level of excellence that our community deserves. We're going to go do this one time. I brought that process and that name to the city planning department. As the director of the Office of Cultural Affairs, here's what I heard. You can't represent those people. You're not the same. Those people don't live in my neighborhood. The Hispanic community can't raise the money to purchase the land and then build an art center. The center has to be multi-purpose with health and human services. And finally, stay out of it, Margie. It's not your job. It's the responsibility of the public works department. Unfortunately, I had accepted the responsibility to implement the city council's cultural policy. Yeah. And therefore, it was my job. Yeah. That began, however, a very personal side of my life that I have rarely had a chance to talk about, so thank you, Kate. I'm only going to take three more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> the city uh, public works department had a process because I was the lead department. I was a part of the conversation, but not a part of the process. And so God sent me an assistant whose name was Jan Adams. He sent me an assistant to help me realize what I had prayed for, strength and courage. Mm. This woman was a spy. 
<laughs> evil. <laughs> she was devious. She fed Jim Schultz, is that his name, for the Dallas Observer? All kinds of unfortunate, misaligned information, including the fact that a gentleman whose name is Michael Johnson, who I didn't know, worked for one of the firms that was contending for the, this project, alleging that I had a relationship with him. Well, she was halfway right. And Michael Johnson, who lives in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, is my first cousin. Has nothing to do with this man. The <laughs> <laughs> African American, has, however, is an engineer. And he would call me frequently to check on me. In his <laughs> she was my teacher. She schooled me. She helped me understand that there are snakes in the wild. Mm. But I learned years later, when I moved to Nigeria to take a job there, that it only takes a small stick to kill a snake. Mm. The allegations could not be proven to be correct. But in the meantime, I'm sitting in my office in the Majestic Theater one night, worrying about the community conversation, worrying about raising the money to buy the land, worrying about getting a memo done that I was supposed to get done, and I got a phone call. This one might get me. From Curtis Meadows. Local philanthropist at the time ran the Meadows Foundation. He said, what are you doing? How are you holding up? I said, I'm weary, but I'm hanging on. He said, I'm coming to pick you up. He brought me to this place, this land. He said, do you want it? Oh. I, I, I'm not lying to you. You know why he was able to say that to me? Because we had a relationship. We had trust. My commissioners trusted me. The city council members trusted me. But most importantly, Jesse Chavayan trusted me. allegations were going by the wayside, but continuing. John Ware was city manager. I called him and I said, Mr. Ware, Curtis Meadows wants to gift the community the property to build this cultural center. But all he wants is a meeting with you. And John Ware, who taught me how to stand <coughs> straight, he cussed me out more days than, than, than not. But he taught me how not to goddamn cry. There's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in arts administration. <laughs> and so the journalist, Jim Schultz, I hope somebody knows him and tells him that I wish him well, <laughs> continued to write the most scathing, the most unfortunate uh, article which called for the new city manager, Ted Benavides, not Mary Sue, as many people assumed, to call for an audit of me and my department. So much so that the city auditors showed up on my doorstep at my home looking for a laptop computer that Jan alleged I had stolen from the city. And the city auditor, when I opened the door, said, do you live here? Told me what he was there looking for. I showed him the laptop, which had been gifted to my daughter by her new Wake Forest University field hockey team, where she would be leaving in a few months to go away to college. But I couldn't go, because I couldn't leave this turmoil that was happening. I'll never forgive myself for making that decision, mm -hmm. sending my child away for four years, essentially. While this is happening, the city council
council members who also trust me said, well, what have you done in my community lately, Margie? So we launched a process to design a program that would provide equitable access to quality arts learning for every child in the city. And you all know that organization now to be called Big Arts. This is happening at the same time. We're getting the neighborhood touring program and finding a dilapidated housing <coughs> complex that was about to be demolished. And Ronnie Jeffy put artists, Emmanuel Gillespie, many of you know, was one of those young artists, in that project to create art for people in the neighborhood. We didn't stop working, we didn't keep working. And finally, the groundbreaking that you just saw here happened. And it happened because by that time I didn't give a fuck. <laughs> you know what? I didn't care. I didn't care what Dallas thought. I didn't care what the white people thought about us raising money or not. I didn't care. We were going to do this because Curtis Meadows had given us the land. After much turmoil, the Ricardo Lazaretto, the late, agreed to do this project. And he said he understood from day one that Dallas was a marginalizing community. And when he showed the first set of drawings with that tower, which was much taller than the one you see today, which would have had a mural from top to bottom, concession I made to keep this project moving. I knew that by the time we got to groundbreaking, which may or may not be why you don't see me and my team on the film, because we didn't give a fuck about it. <laughs> we commissioned artists to make those shovels, which, which to us meant the hands of the people are building this, the will of the people are building this, the tool that turns the soil comes from the people, and the spirit came from the people. My spirit by that time, I was done with that. I knew that day that I had to go because I refused to live my life in a city that disrespected people of color in the ways that it did at that moment in time. But I didn't have to do anything. I went home, went about my business. I got a random phone call two days later from a woman that said, are you Margie Reese? The mayor of LA is looking for you. And she quickly put him on the phone. It must have been around Thanksgiving, because it was this month. But I want to bring it back to center, you guys. I had given all that I had to give to this project. But I hadn't given all that I had. When I came back to the grand opening of this facility, I was invisible. Visibly invisible. I didn't exist. I had been removed from the memory of this work. Mm. And you know what? That saddened me. Mm. Thanks to Cora Cardona and Jeff Hurst, as has been mentioned, to David Lozano, to my team, to the, uh, the office formerly known as the OCA. Thanks to Jesse Zafaya, Anita Martinez, the dancers of that company, the warriors that came forward to city council meetings time after time and said yes, to Terry Aguilar who hustled to teach me, to help me understand the multi-dimensional multi aspects of Latino culture. So for those of you here today, thanks for letting me vent a little bit, tell that story. And wherever you come from to be here today, you're here today in this place. Whatever tasks you have to do when you leave this place, take them on with every ounce of life that you have or don't the hell do it. Mm. <laughs> the main thing, the main thing, don't get distracted by distractors. Don't let allegations bring you down so that you think you have to defend your honor. That my good name is good. Yeah. Why do I need to defend it against this marginalizing, racist attack? Wherever you're going when you leave here, remember, nobody cares about your passion. 
Nobody cares if you love what you do. What they care about is that you understand the rules of the game. And you stay in the game. And you make sure that there is someone that follows you that you bring into the game with you. Because if young people can't get in the game, they can't win. You're not doing this alone. Your job is to teach and bring forth so that you can go. Mm. The report from the city auditor was never released. <laughs> 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 the only findings were that the allegations had been false. Mm -hmm. Two things I say to you now. Thank you, Dale, for teaching me how to grow and grow. aren't just technical, they can be emotional. Mm. And so when I saw that video, when I saw those seeds, the beans and grains and rice being poured into the land, and the ritual, ritualized pitcher of water poured over the land, and Jocko's flute, and the drum in the background, that's what stood out to me. And that's my path as an artist towards sustainability and community. It's not separate. And so this is the journey. And I, and, and I want to say this too, and this is very important. It's been a struggle to become the resident, one of the two resident theater companies mm -hmm in at the Latino Comfort Center. It's been a struggle for at least six years. Speech writing, community organizing, negotiation. I'm gonna say this, and I'm saying it for the symposium. I think community means reconciliation. means a difficult path, it means working with all people, and it means that we're going to work it out, and we're not going to give it up. And I waited until this moment because i got to say it now, because right now I believe I belong. I believe I belong in this festival, in this symposium, was created for this building. And this building was created for this symposium and this festival and for all of us. So now I want to thank the people because I have hope because of the people who are in place right now. So I want to take this moment now to thank Assistant City Manager Liz Seville. <laughs> Thank our new director of the Office of Arts and Culture, Martin Elise Felipe. <laughs> and uh, and my brother's over there, the ma the manager of the Latino Cultural Center, Gerardo Robles, who I've worked with for years. <laughs> The Academy of Theater would not be who we are also without Gerardo's work, but also without Rafael, the manager of Oak Park Culture. When I was good at, at the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, they taught us something really important. It's important that our people 
are positioned like cells in the wall that keeps us outside of where we belong. The wall that, 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 that is an obstacle to us. Sometimes it's, we feel like it's a city. It's important that our familia is in that system. Our, this familia can turn the levers. And that's what's happened. That, this, we could not be here today without those people that I mentioned. And of course, I can't forget our commissioner, the liaison of, of the city of Dallas Office of Arts and Culture to Katamia Theater, Vicki Meek. <laughs> so we're going way off script now. <laughs> but this is what I think the symposium is about. We're going to touch the depths, and I invite you to touch the depths. Lead with your heart, lead with your mind. Just listen. But um, this is this is not a conference. This is a this is a gathering, an encuentro. So uh, I I, want, I invite you to um, I invite you to be continue to be an artist, to write notes, poems, drawing, because we have here poets, visual artists. Healers, community organizers, city officials, city employees, and we all belong to each other. So we have, with this, I want to introduce our distinguished guests, our keynote speakers. We're going to hear from, uh, and let's begin, we're going to hear from uh, who I'm very proud of, who I've been so inspired by, my dear friend, my sister, the Mellon Foundation, uh, playwright in residence for Academy of Theater, Virginia Grice. The daughter of a working class white man and a Chinese Mexican immigrant, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, a Mexican, Mexican American majority city at a complicated crossroads where the deep south meets the west, meets the borderlands. Just three hours from the US Mexico border, I spent much of my childhood in my grandmother's house in Monterrey, Mexico. My tío Andres and my grandfather were Chinese merchants in Mexico. They sold fruits and vegetables in the Mercado Polón, the old marketplace, the one they tore down in the 50s. After my grandfather died, my uncle left the business, but not after helping several of the men who worked for him start businesses of their own. Because of this, Andres always had an endless supply of groceries. I remember going with him to the market to pick up boxes of fresh fruits and vegetables. I don't ever remember pain. We would come home and he would give some of those groceries away to the neighbors and I asked him about it once as a kid and he responded by saying, Nadie va a tener hambre aquí in his broken Spanish. I learned at a very young age that in order to survive as a people, we would have to make sure that no one went hungry. There's actually a word for this concept in Cantonese. I cannot remember what it is but I never forgot the lesson. Nadien va a tener hambre aquí. You see, this lesson is fundamental to everything that I do. My body, this body, my body of work and the work of my body is not just mine. It's part of a collective body. The brown body, the female body, the working class body, the queer body. C. 
singing, creating, building together with others. At its very essence, theater, I think, is fundamentally three things. The imagining of a world, building that world with other people, and then an invitation, right? Where we invite other people to witness and to be a part of the world we build together. What if, instead of a play, we thought of theater that way? And imagining of and building something better together with others. At the onset of the pandemic, I just fell apart. And I turned to a lesson that I learned from my Chinese Mexican mother. I started cleaning. This was the tool and the technology that she taught me for survival. Wake up in the morning, open the windows, burn the incense, light the candles, sweep out the old, do it again. Wake up in the morning, open the windows, burn the incense, light the candles, sweep out the old, do it again. Wake up in the morning, open the windows, burn the incense, light the candles, sweep out the old, do it again, do it again, and again, and again, and again, until something, anything changes. Olympia a ritual, a ceremony, a practice. At the onset of the pandemic, a dear friend of mine, artist Veronica Castillo, shut down her gallery on the south side of San Antonio and began cooking food for those in need. Comida casera, outdoors meals on a wood-burning stove, fresh ingredients. Alongside her husband, Beto Salas, and a volunteer team that helped with the preparation and serving of meals on a weekly basis, she's made more than 20,000 meals to date for the elders, her friends, her neighbors, and the unhoused, who are also her neighbors. There are so many examples like this one of artists practicing mutual aid during the pandemic. The way the poet Yosimar Reyes advocated for his grandmother and all of her friends direct and clear asks on Facebook, the taco truck got stolen, girl. We need your help. This viejita needs money for rent. Or the way that Jack in Brooklyn turned their theater into a food distribution hub. Or the way that Christina Wong organized the Auntie Sewing Brigade to sew masks for communities in need when our government failed them. These are just a few examples there are many more. Inspired by the work of Veronica, a year into the pandemic, a group of us, five women, gathered at her gallery to celebrate the spring equinox by making barbacoa together. This is a thing that I've started to do. This is my third attempt at making barbacoa traditionally. The way that barbacoa is made is by starting a fire in a hole in the ground until the wood burns red. Then you put the meat wrapped in banana leaves into the hole, cover it, and start a fire above it. So there are two fires, one below and one above. And you sit with the fire, watching it, listening to it, close to the earth for over 17 hours. This is after digging the hole, which took us about a week to do. I've been told this is that only one restaurant in the entire state of Texas is allowed to make barbacoa in this traditional way because they were grandfathered in before that way of preparing meat was deemed to be a health code violation. It's not the first time our culture has been deemed illegal. And I don't know if that story is true, but it's a good one, so I'm telling it to you. <laughs> Hoping to find new ways for gathering, of being together in the middle of a global pandemic, we stayed up all night cooking and telling stories, and we invited others to join with us. People from across the country took time to acknowledge spring, a new season, where they were at in their own way, and sent us offerings of poems and pictures and paintings and letters and handmade books, seeds to plant and nurture, audio files and videos of running water the river, the ocean, in Puerto Rico, in Greece, and in Los Angeles, reminding us that we're not alone. Reminding us that we walk this Camino together despite our geographic distance. At this point, we didn't know how much longer the pandemic would last. 
nor did we know how long the gallery would stay open because no income was coming in despite the fact that the resources of the gallery continued to leave. That evening, over the fire, under the stars, the five of us, a small group of folk, made a commitment to each other to treat each other with patience and ethical regard, and that in her mission to make sure that no one went hungry, the five of us would make sure that Veronica and her family didn't go hungry either. We asked each other a very sincere question in this moment of extreme uncertainty. What is your biggest, your boldest, your most audacious dream? At that moment, the feeling of extreme isolation that the five of us were feeling in the middle of a global pandemic went away. And we started not only to share our dreams with each other, but to dream together. Through those conversations, you know, in theater we have workshops, we workshop plays, and so I started to think, what if we created a workshop, a taller, for dreaming? Not for making plays, but as a space where we came together to dream. In Dallas, together with a group of three cultural promotoras, including Lyric J and Yolanda, who are here today, from the neighborhoods, we invited a cohort of 15 artists and organizers from Pleasant Grove, the most incarcerated zip code in the state, which is to say the most incarcerated zip code in the nation, which is to say the most incarcerated zip code in the world. We invited people to imagine with us what a world without police might look like. And the work of the cohort culminated in a public event that they designed in an empty lot they called Freedom Garden, activating the lot through art offerings and song and dance and poetry and manifestos. What would it mean to take over every empty lot in public park, ditches and alleyways as places for people to paint those murals, to meet and gather, places where people could create together, be free together. I recently started working with a community called La Doce on the south side of Tucson. They just bought a building through a community land trust, which happens to have been a Chinese grocery store in a predominantly Mexican, Mexican-American neighborhood. And I have been asked to create a series of talleres for dreaming for folks to come together and collectively dream about what they want that space to be. Last year, for the culmination of the San Antonio Taller for Dreaming, we invited people to join us for an in-person celebration of the spring equinox, something we're not sure we could have even ever happened, something we weren't sure could have even ever happened underneath that night that we sat around the fire, the first spring of a global pandemic. The poet Natalie Diaz taught me a Mojave word, Makiev, which means to gather people from across varied and wide lands to be alongside one another. And people came to San Antonio from Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, Denton, Dallas, <laughs> Austin, Houston, South Dakota, and Jilina, Mexico, many of whom had never been to San Antonio before. We designed this gathering as a performance in three acts, land acknowledgments, a sobra mesa, a three-course meal of corn prepared by the Tayet cohort, and offerings to the river. This past summer, that same group of five women that I described earlier came together to create a participatory action research project, a consulta, focused on the seven block radius around Veronica's gallery, which did in fact survive against all odds. To give you some context, Galeria Eva is on the south side of San Antonio, 10 minutes from downtown, on the border of two city council districts, Depending on who's in office, they'll argue about where the gallery belongs, in which district. It's a majority Latino uh, neighborhood, 15% immigrant. The medium income of the neighborhood is $40,600. 75% of folks in the neighborhood have a high school education, while only 9% obtain a bachelor's degree. It's also where Beto lives with her husband, where they raised with their daughter, where Rossi, one of the five women, works where Marisa teaches, where Mari goes to church, and where my 80-year-old mother-in-law owns the only house she has ever owned in a neighborhood where only half of the people living there own their homes, walking distance to the San Antonio River. 
We began the consulta asking questions about culture and land and what was important to the people in the neighborhood, inviting a small group of those, inviting a small group of five, mirroring the five of us that sat around that fire, inviting a small group of five to the first gathering, asking those people to invite seven more people so that the group continued to grow. And I think that that's one of the things that I really learned working at Fatimia and working during this pandemic, this idea of what if it really was just us five? And what is the infinite proliferation of what can happen when we make a commitment to four other people to say that I will be the one that you can call when you can't make the rent, for example. To me, that's what familia is. We um, organized around Sobre Mesas a series of conversations at the table with food. That became the site for our shared research that centered the rooted wisdoms and embodied knowledges, the personal archives of the local communities that raised us. Thinking about that statistic, I just want to take a moment to think about 50% of people owning their homes in the neighborhood. They just started this year putting up signs renaming the neighborhood. It's now the Lone Star District. And this is a strategy that's happening all over the country in San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Los Angeles. Entire communities decimated and disappeared as a city grows. So what we're doing when we meet around that table what we're doing is we're fighting against forgetting, against the disappearance of our communities by reclaiming and imagining our future together against all odds. I've been so grateful to be the playwright in residence at Academia Theater. Through the Mellon Foundation for the past four years, I've actually been on salary here. It seems like a simple premise. Arts organizations hiring artists to actually be artists. <laughs> I even have health insurance. And in the state of Texas, that is no small thing. If we want the arts to sustain community, we have to actively sustain artists to ensure that no one goes hungry. What happens when you sustain artists I'm going to do a quick list. In addition to the Talleres for Dreaming at the play, as, as the playwright in residence at Academia, I did a virtual theater piece that we turned into a coloring book and a radio play. Planted a garden in my backyard, the seed for Huertos Familiares that we'll start planting at Galeria in the spring. A virtual performance on iPhones that became part of an installation transforming the entire Latino cultural center when people were still too scared to leave their home. A COVID version of Your Healing is Killing Me, a touring version of the show that will soon be at the Encuentro in LA. We trained cultural promotoras in three different neighborhoods to create community toolboxes for self-defense. We trained cultural promotoras from activist organizations to facilitate manifestos and writing workshops. They also hosted a community tour of the show at a cultural center, a park, a community college, a pan-African bookstore. But when we pay artists to be artists, we're not paying them just to complete a project or to produce a product. We're paying them to dream. Mm -hmm. And when we pay artists to dream, it has been our responsibility to make the conditions possible for those dreams to become material, for those dreams to become reality against all odds. During that time, I also had the opportunity to create my own processes of development, my own means of production, con ganas, a todo dar, making an album and a theatrical concert that will be at Fregones in two weeks. We offered community songwriting workshops everywhere we went, from Austin, Texas, to College Park, Maryland, from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara to San Jose, California, in the Bronx. We'll work with Running for Año 43, led by the father of one of the disappeared teachers in Mexico. We transformed a 100-foot train shed next to a rice silo into a multi-sensory market that culminated in an outdoor dinner prepared by Veronica over a wood-burning fire. 
The meal included bok choy and wheat lakocha dumplings and nopal salad with resorte and sweet pea shoots, white rice and arachera and red snapper a la parilla with eggplants. For many, it was the first meal they shared in public space since the beginning of the pandemic. I don't ever, I don't ever, I lost the words, but I don't ever take for granted, that's the word, I don't ever take for granted sharing a meal with my people ever again. I don't take that for granted. We also took over a plaza in downtown Los Angeles in Chinatown, creating seven installations throughout the plaza with dreams and memories and stories that we're going to ship hopefully all over the southwest. The next place they'll go is Tucson. See, what if we thought of theater that way? What if instead of a play, theater was a backyard garden, a fugitive library, a taillette for dreaming, an open air kitchen, a meal with friends and strangers, a place where we gather to tell stories fully embodied at a table of our own making, where nobody goes hungry. Gracias. Great pleasure to introduce you to Wendy Chenefel, yes. the co-artistic director of Alternate Boots. elevate those stories, so thank you very much. I have a script that I'm going to try to use. Uh, so thank you to Kavia Theater and to David for inviting me to be with you today. I typically try to push a young person onto the stage instead of myself, lovingly push a young person on the stage, but David said the magic words to get me to say yes. Vicki Meek is doing it. <laughs> so if you haven't, you will experience later uh, why Vicki Meek has long been a bright light in our region. In Texas, and particularly a champion of, as I knew it when I went to school down the street at Texas Women's University, sunny South Dallas. As well as a friend, a member of Alternate Roots, um, and she's also a member of my board, so I better behave, so let me get back <laughs> on it. I'm also thrilled to share this mic with you today. I'm going to call you Other Vicky. Uh, Grace. Yes, yes. And uh, thank you for sharing. Um, and it's very connected to what I'll be talking about today, what you described to me as part of this beloved community. So thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here as we learn together and share together. Um, quick shout out to the interpreters and to the tech team because you are making this accessible for all of us here. <laughs> so a bit about me, I'm Wendy Shenefeld, I use she and her pronouns, and I live on the unceded lands of the Choctaw, Quapa, and Natchez people in Jackson, Mississippi, mm -hmm. our state's capital, also known as the Republic of Jaffrica. <laughs> it is my chosen home, I grew up in Memphis, but it's my chosen home that I deeply love, yet we have to fight the system every day to get clean water. I still cannot drink the water that comes out of my faucet. I go across the county line and steal it from my parents. I'm a Memphis-raised dancer, old teacher, writer, and wannabe comedian. 
I'm a Tessie from Texas Women's University, and along with my friend and colleague for nearly a decade, Paige Hareton, we are the newly named co-executive directors of Alternate Roots. Right. So some of you in here are rooters, and some of you in here are rooters, but you don't know it yet. Roots is an organization based in the southern USA whose mission is to support the creation and presentation of original art in all its forms, which is rooted in a particular community of place, tradition, and spirit. As a coalition of cultural workers, we strive to be allies in the elimination of all forms of oppression. Roots is committed to social and economic justice and the protection of the natural world and addresses these concerns through our programs and services. We serve the 14 southern states, including Texas, because Texas is the South. The South. <laughs> it is your own nation, I understand that too, but it is the South. <laughs> and we're a, Roots is a member-led organization where voting members make up our board of directors. So, I know I hear all the, mmm, yep. So we currently have 230 general members and 151 voting members. So our board has 151 members of the board of directors, right? It's a beautiful way to work. <laughs> As we make plans to celebrate our 50th birthday in 2026, We've taken on the theme of Southern Soil Sankofa Seeds. Sankofa is an Akan word from the Twi language of Ghana, meaning go back and get it. This Sankofa season calls on all of us to honor our roots, reclaim our past, and nurture the seeds of change. So as Roots is a coalition of artists, organizers, and cultural workers, who use our art practices to uproot all forms of oppression. We believe this seemingly lofty goal is achievable as we work to actively embody the beloved community. Now, does everybody know what that means when I say the beloved community? Is that a familiar word for you? It is a term that most people think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when we use that word. So the ideas of the beloved community and St. Cope are gonna be referenced a lot, um, so I wanna make sure we all understand those concepts. Old teacher, remember? <laughs> so when Dr. King often used this word as a community in which everyone is cared for, what Vicki just mentioned, absent of poverty, hunger, and hate. So a community that is governed not by violence or conflict, but governed and grounded in love. Now, I know that may sound extremely far from where we are in this country right now, especially if you log into Facebook. <laughs> the past few years around the world, in our country, and particularly in our homes in the American South, we have embodied the phrase, when America gets a cold, the South gets the flu. Our communities have been hard hit by increasingly oppressive systems, exacerbated by a struggling economy, the global pandemic, violence, genocide, lies about our immigrant neighbors being repeated by a former president, and the not unexpected backlash against LGBTQ folks, BIPOC communities, and of course, arts organizations. As a coalition of artists, we can dream and create the organization and community we want our members to thrive in. We learned over the past four years that we can get through challenging times by being creative, nimble, flexible, and yes, loving. As artists and creatives, we want to have one foot firmly planted in the world as it is, and the other foot planted firmly in the world as it should be. With this in mind, let's check what's happening right now in the Southeast. And I'm so glad I'm not going to be the only crier on the mic. My young people, I was like, oh, Miss Wendy's on the mic. You know she's going to start crying. Yes, I am. 
So I have company today, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm gonna get emotional. Hurricane Helene was a massive storm. From Florida through Georgia, South and North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, West, Car West Virginia, the area impacted is vast, and it is all part of our roots region. As Southerners, we understand that the national media and funding will focus on the urban center, while rural towns and hollers, often the, most, the worst impacted, will often also be the last to receive support. We're sitting with the image of the Arts District in Asheville, underwater. We've been holding our annual Roots Week in the mountains around Asheville since 2001. It is our home. So this area holds a very special place in our hearts. We know that artists are among the people often living in those areas that are hardest hit by storms. These people are our people, including several of our members and staff who we didn't Thank goodness we were able to locate the last person um, just yesterday. Uh, so our people are safe. Uh, our hearts and hands are with them because we know the recovery will be long. Living in the South, we are on the front lines of the climate crisis. So we've tried to create and operationalize some processes that keep us safe. When storms are about to hit, we check in with our Roots members through our state listservs and phone calls. We did this as Helene was approaching land, and the state-by-state -state support offered among our community has been beautiful to witness. Our members will chime in with an offer for a ride if they're evacuating, or if they're staying put, they may have an extra room. They share how they're preparing to ride out the storm because a lot of people in North Carolina, those of us that live on the Gulf Coast, we know what to do. The folks in the mountains in North Carolina may not have. Um, so they share how they're gonna prepare for the storm. One pro tip, please don't eat all your hurricane snacks in the first three hours like I always do. <laughs> <laughs> this is also a way for folks to let us know they're safe. Um, if and when they have access to phone service, it's a vital way that we stay connected in community care through tough times. We also share resources and ways to donate from our trusted partners, but we wait to get our cues from the ground um, on what's needed next. So increasingly destructive storms are part of the reality of climate crisis. From Katrina 19 years ago to Helene today, folks across the South are looking back and bringing forward lessons learned and remixing them grounded in place. From the Cajun Navy rescuing neighbors in South Louisiana during Katrina, to the Mountain Mule team bringing needed supplies to Black Mountain. We rely on our neighbors and strangers. In the middle of a crisis, the beloved community seems a bit more attainable. So how do we build on the ways that we take care of each other as Southerners during disasters distributing all forms of mutual aid from chainsaws to gumbo to develop the infrastructure that supports, supports personal, artistic, and organizational health. As artists, we believe we can do this. We can build this beloved community without replicating the cumbersome systems that keep folks out instead of providing access and creating and collecting the songs and stories along the journey. When Dr. King envisioned the beloved community, he acknowledged that the barriers are systemic. Our infrastructure, education, healthcare, and other systems cannot be reformed in isolation or by individuals. We believe that building and working within coalitions and formations can be a path to healthy communities. In addition to Alternate Roots being a coalition of artists and cultural workers, we currently build with several other co coalitions. So I'm an old teacher. I'm going to touch on a few of the coalitions, and then I'm going to invite you to do homework. If you want to know more about those coalitions, come ask me tomorrow. 
So the Southern Movement Assembly is a formation of organizations across the South that recognize the special and unique history of the U.S. South and have come together to build self-determination and power by cultivating movement and infrastructure by and for Southern workers and all oppressed peoples. Alternate Roots, along with Roots Member Spirit House in North Carolina and the Stay Appalachian Youth Project are the primary arts and culture organizations on the Southern Movement Assembly Governments team. So the rest of the team members are movement organizations. Um, the cultural workers bring our art and healing practices into the spaces of deep movement work. This work is often heavy. To lighten the weight, we look back to the practices of the uh, Southern Black Liberation and Civil Rights Movement and the concept of mass meetings. Are y'all familiar with that term? Mass meetings. During the Civil Rights Movement, community meetings were organized primarily by the NAACP to report out on any updates, give instructions for the next day, maybe get a good word, a little short sermon, and to sing. Anyone know any songs from the Civil Rights Movement? I mean, you can yell them out if you know. Y'all don't want me to sing. <laughs> what's, something you, what's a song you uh, associate with Civil Rights Movement? James? Uh, Turn Me Around. What's another one? We Shall Overcome. Fannie Lou Hamer. His Eyes Are On The Sparrow. I can't hear you. Oh, his Eyes Are On The Sparrow. His Eyes Are On The Sparrow. This little light of mine. So these songs that we know as movement songs, you sung those alongside your fellow civil rights workers, and that made room for the grief. That made room for the heaviness, the emotional labor of the work. And it moved it into a place of strength and joy. I've spoken to many civil rights worker, uh, civil rights movement veterans who said those songs sustained them to the next day. Those songs gave them the courage to be out organizing where danger was ever present. It was the music they sung in their heads and out loud when confronted by the police and jail. This is the power of our art practices. So this civil rights movement is also the time of the Free Southern Theater. Founded in the winter of 1963 by Dr. Doris Derby. Please don't ever forget that Dr. Doris Derby was one of the founders of Free Southern Theater. You know they always leave a woman out. <laughs> and also by John O'Neill and Gilbert Moses at Tougaloo College in Mississippi before moving it to New Orleans in the late 60s. So Free Southern Theater sought to build a new institution of theater that spoke to the experience of poor black Southerners. John O'Neill encouraged the audience to become part of the performance. Free Southern Theater con continued their performances and community workshops long after Freedom Summer. We're actively still celebrating the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer right now. These workshops um, encouraged the audiences how to um, think how the plays apply to their lives um, and the illumination of the human condition. Now our ancestor, Baba John O'Neill of Free Southern Theater, was also a founding member of Alternate Roots. So you feel in this connection, these syncophases, community, again, the power of the arts, and us trying to bring that forward now. Another coalition that Roots builds with is the Southern Power Fund. Southern Power Fund strives to resource movements, expand connections, and build shared infrastructure so we can build beyond disasters. We envision a world where our communities and movements are abundantly resourced, practicing self-governance and exercising self-determination where movement leaders and funder allies committed to resourcing movement organizations and infrastructure rooted in Southern communities. We have eight movement organizations and additional philanthrop philanthropic partners, gotta slow myself down, 
And we came together during the height of the pandemic and in the wake of the racial uprisings that followed the extrajudicial killing of George Floyd. I represent Roots and part of the steering committee alongside another friend of mine and David's, Jorge Diaz of Aditarte. Aditarte is based in Puerto Rico and is an organization of working class artists and organizers promoting cultural solidarity. Out of the eight Southern Movement organizations, Roots and Agitarte are the only two arts organizations that serve in that body. Our being part of the decision-making body has supported one quarter of the funds that we raised uh, being distributed to arts organizations. So I had to run the numbers because I was curious because I kept saying, we need more money for the arts organizations. We got to give money to the arts organizations. They were like, Wendy, a quarter of this money is going to the arts organizations. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so since 2020, Southern Power Fund, the coalition of us at Southern Power Fund has moved more than $22.5 million and supported more than 400 frontline groups in 13 states in the American South and Puerto Rico. I'm going to say that number again. Mm -hmm. We have distributed $22.5 million across the South, a quarter of which is going to arts organizations. And for you funders, or for those of you who can position yourself with funders, we don't have an application, and there's no final report. <laughs> Over the next five years, our goal is to distribute, drum roll, a hundred million to a range of Southern Frontline organizations and formations, including arts organizations. Now, it's not all about the funding. We know that. It's not all about the funding. But I suspect that 22 million goes a long way in our communities in the South that are used to creatively making a dollar out of 15 cents. So the last group I'll talk about, and then I will take my seat, we also have our Intercultural Leadership Institute. This is a fellowship program for culturally diverse artists and cultural bearers that deepen connections for strengthening emergent and authentic leadership. ELE is a collaboration of Roots, uh, First Peoples Fund, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, uh, Pai Foundation, SIP Culture in Mississippi, First Alaskans Institute, and the International Association of Blacks and Dance. This effort grew out of our direct experiences as leaders of these founding cultural organizations. We found that many personal and professional leadership programs emphasized dominant cultural norms, modes of learning and social approaches that just didn't match our commitment to cultural equity and change making in our own community. Community, excuse me. In November, we will launch year six of our cohort. And uh, we're filming, right? Yes. yes. So I'm not going to spill all the tea, <laughs> but I will say that the ELE partners, along with several other culturally specific arts organizations across the U.S., have been collectively organizing with a funder. And we will have a wonderful, beautiful announcement coming out very, very soon that will impact arts organizations below whose annual budgets are under $500,000. So we're very excited about that. And it's the power of working as a coalition. Because if a funder, I'm not saying that funder, because we love them, let's say a funder, comes and says, we would love to give you this amount of money. And we say, how much are you giving someone else? And it's a lot less. If you work in a coalition, then you're building power to say, no, thank you. Come back when you've got a little more money on the table. And it was a beautiful experiment, um, and we're pretty happy. I hope the funders are happy, too. But it's going to get a lot of money into the hands of arts organizations that look like the people in this room. So I'll close with this. 
Um, again, this is a lot of information. So if you want some more information, please catch me in the next couple of days. Uh, so we'll take it back to Dr. King. Uh, in Ebony Magazine, 1957, Dr. King wrote, Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, and destroy, but it cannot create nor organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative, and redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies. Love is the solution. So I just gave a lot of examples of how we use our artistic practices collectively to build leadership and power. Power is not a bad word. It's just how you use it. But to build leadership and power, to push through this heavy work and grief, to celebrate our culture and occupy spaces of joy, to keep each other safe, here's to us remembering and remixing our ancestral and artistic practices and moving in love towards a beloved community. Thank you. Well, now it is my pleasure. I know we've done a lot of caring on about this one right here. And every bit of it is true. I think a lot of us have been encouraged and coached and mentored by this person. Um, and I'm grateful to call her my friend. Please come on up. Thank you. for having the foresight to organize this important symposium and for inviting me to be a part of it. I am honored to be able to share some of my experiences and insights with you today. Um, many years ago, I became an arts administrator when I realized that communities were impacted more by artists practicing in community than in elite cultural institutions. Although I was a child who was exposed to the arts at a very early age, that in the 19, at an early age in a city that in the 1950s and 60s was bustling with arts activity, I recognized that my experience was not common for most black children. My dad was a social worker, and my mom at the time was a school teacher and later the education director for the Philadelphia Urban League. So their access to the cultural resources of our city had to offer were pretty extensive. The irony is, so much of these were free, but you had to know this in order to take advantage of them, and this information wasn't particularly uh, available for everybody. One of the jobs that my dad had, or held, image coming up here, was the assistant director of a place called the Wharton Center, a community center created in the early days of the 20th century. It was one of the many centers open as Philadelphia was gaining a significant immigrant population as well as black migrants from the South. Primarily set up to provide social services, Wharton Center catered to a working class community that included workers in the area factories and shipyards. My dad was a resident social worker, but because he loved the arts, he convinced the center director to include cultural programs in the everyday offerings. His thought was that working people deserved uh, to have cultural experiences just as the elite class did. My first art exhibition by professional black artists that I attended was at Wharton Center. Some of my first live music concerts were heard there too. After school, students had access to art classes in a myriad of disciplines. Over time, Wharton Center became a place where the community knew they could experience a high quality cultural program that centers them. 
There were several other places that offered free art classes, like the famous Fleischer Art Memorial, founded in 1898. It is one of the country's oldest nonprofit community art schools committed to advancing the vision of its founder, Samuel S. Fleischer, who believed that art is one of society's greatest assets and equalizers. From the doorway of his graphic sketch club, he invited, and this is a quote, the world to come and learn art. The institution's stated goals embody Fleischer's core values, which were, number one, the artist in us all. Within every individual are the ingredients for original artistic expression. Number two, art is a pathway to fulfillment. An individual's ability to use art is a vital means for emotional and intellectual exploration and growth. And number three, art enriches the community. By nurturing each individual's creative potential, we aim to provide social, cultural, and economic benefits to the community as a whole. I had my first formal visual art education at this extraordinary institution at the age of eight. All of the classes were taught by area art school faculty or professional artists, so the quality of instruction was exceptional. Another institution rooted in, in service to the community was Settlement Music School, established in 1908 as an organization like Wharton Center. It was originally established for immigrants. Like Wharton and Fleischer, it was also free to any public school student. It quickly expanded to include dance and later arts therapy and served a very diverse population. My and my sister's dan early dance classes were taken at this prestigious institution. And I dare say, if you ask any of the, quote, famous musicians that hail from Philly, if they attended settlement music school, the answer will be, of course. Both my brother and sister took piano and violin classes, respectively, there. Along with these cultural institutions, the, public, the Philadelphia Public School District had a robust arts education program for many decades, which provided free instruments and art supplies to interested students. It's no coincidence that Philly has produced so many stellar musicians and artists in many different disciplines. So why am I telling you all this? I bring all this to your, uh, information to your attention because I want you to understand the common denominator in all of this is the idea that all these institutions began with the idea that the arts are for everyone and could be used to expand the minds of citizens. These institutions were not outreach extensions of elite cultural institutions, uh, cultural entities, but were firmly rooted in working class communities and served largely working class populations. They featured high quality programming and employed equally high quality faculty. As Philadelphia moved away from providing robust arts education in its schools, these institutions took on an even more important role in developing culture in the city. They may all charge tuition now, but they also provide substantial scholarship support so that no student gets denied instruction due to the inability to pay. <coughs> so fast forward to 2024, and the only center no longer operating is the Wharton Center, which was located in predominantly Black North Philly, in an area that has since gentrified due in large part to the expansion of Temple University. And that is my alma mater, so you know, but it's <laughs> an institution too, okay? Uh, I owe my understanding of culture's role in community development to my participation in all three of these centers. I also owe my understanding of sustainability in the arts to my study of how these institutions built community. Now let me pivot a moment to discuss the cultural landscape of early America so we can understand how we arrived at the place we find ourselves today with models of institution building that don't serve us. If you look at how the arts in this country became a way of differentiating the haves from the have-nots, you will understand why we have a division between, quote, high art and everything else. The arts became a status symbol that labeled a person as highly educated if they could afford to be a patron. Since the first immigrants who stole this land uh, who stole this land from the indigenous were from England, Scotland, Holland, France, and Spain. Their descendants decided 
the cultures of these European countries were superior to all others. So, we had the development of a cultural landscape that centered Europe, devalued all other cultures, relegating them to the category of folk art. This was the beginning of the extraction of culture from the day-to-day, -day, the beginning of elitism in cultural arts appreciation, and the beginning of targeted philanthropy. As America shaped an elite class, it had to provide experiences that only that class could access, and culture <laughs> became one of those experiences. But understand, Culture is a feature of every society. Before Europe became a major colonizer in the world, every civilization had a culture that its people enjoyed and perpetuated by passing down cultural traditions. These traditions included exposing all segments of the community in their practice, which in turn allowed for their sustainability. If we examine how culture developed in Europe, this was also true until the advent of royal ruling classes and, the, and later the bourgeoisie. The music, movement, visual manifestations, and storytelling of people tended to derive from the life experiences of those people. Everyone partook, and everyone was equally invested in the preservation of traditional culture. So, when we look at the notion of community arts development in a contemporary context, perhaps we need to dip back into time and study how pre-colonial uh, people's embraced culture and used it to bolster communities, not separate it. Maybe we need to spend some quality time relearning how culture undergirds civilization and it isn't simply something to be consumed. We talk about sustainability, but what we really need to be exploring is what culture can do to unite community and energize it. We need to truly embrace the philosophy of so many cultures that have never been separated that have never separated culture from every other aspect of life's necessities. Our reliance on useless business models simply because we are told this is the way to be successful in the arts is what's killing so many of our institutions. If we don't begin to understand that to sustain anything, we must first build it as something intrinsic to a community. It must be as useful to that community as all the other aspects of life that are deemed a necessity. This is not the model we have been handed. The idea that, quote, culture is, a, is divorced from all other parts of our existence and must be obtained through select offerings by select institutions is one designed to create a hierarchy that will always render some people as outsiders. People of color have been burdened for generations by having to fit into a box that has nothing to do with their historical cultural norms. The post-colonial world of color is saddled with colonial indoctrination that perpetuates this cycle of cultural exclusivity. In my work as a community arts developer, I have found it far more beneficial to build from the community up and never to approach the work from the top down. I listen deeply and then I respond. I assume the community knows better than me what it needs. This presupposes that every member of a community is a potential creator, and that the culture of that community is a worthy starting point for any work that I would endeavor to do. People will support that which speaks to their hearts. Sustainability is a natural byproduct of this heart cultivation. Both my arts administration career and my personal artistic practice have a foundation in this philosophy. My first, public, my first big public art project was created at Project Row Houses, where, in the honor of being, where I had the honor of being part of the first cohort of artists to open this new, now world famous project. Are all of you familiar with Project Row Houses? If not, get familiar. Yeah. <laughs> um, founded by seven African American visual artists who wanted to stave off the demolition of 10 shotgun houses in Third Ward, Houston. This project afforded me the opportunity to interview elders and longtime residents of the neighborhood to understand the culture of that area. I listened and learned so much about what had made the area special in the eyes of the community. My house became a visual manifestation of that history, using elements given to me by one of the neighborhood historians and things that I found under the house. I used the tape voices of the people I interviewed as the soundscapes in various rooms. I still maintain connections to the people in that neighborhood. And that was a 
Broadband. This project was done in 1993. And, and now, in, in 2024, I've embarked on another public art project that has its foundation in my first public project. This time working with 10th Street Residents Associations here, here in Dallas um, to preserve the history and culture of this African American community. This project is sponsored by Na National Sculpture Center as a part of National Public Program, and it involves me working with a cohort of younger, and as you can see, much younger <laughs> artists. Um, okay. Some from different, di different disciplines. Designed as a multi-year project, it also looks to capture the stories of a disappearing Mexican-American neighborhood and a mostly erased community of the indigenous. Because of the nature of the project, we have been able to attract funding support from sources that don't have a history of funding arts projects. So why is this important? Well, as I stated earlier, the work of the artist who wants to sustain a practice in a world where the arts are not truly valued, that work must speak to the heart of the community so that the voices of the community find a safe landing place. Then, when funders are looking at a program's impact, they will see a program that the people want. And here's another well-kept secret often overlooked by many of us. When the people want something, they find ways of supporting that with something, that something, with both their money and their time. So I will end here and challenge all of you to do some deep soul searching to determine if your work is grounded in the notion that it, that its first obligation is to speak to the hearts of those you want to serve. That saying, if you build it, they will come, should really say, if you build it with them, they will come. Thank you for being here, and I encourage you all to take this opportunity in this symposium to connect, to stay connected, and to use this network as you do your work. And now it's my deep pleasure to introduce our fearless and visionary new leader of the Office of Arts and Culture, the grand Martin Elise Philippe. Well then, no clothes, almost clothes. <laughs> um, uh, before I share my few remarks, I want to acknowledge any elected officials that might be at this place. Well, Dark, thank you for your service. If you are here, appointed officials, the assistant city manager did step out of the city of Carrera, and of course, our Arts and Culture Advisory Commission, Vicki Lee. I want to shout out the staff of the Latino Cultural Center and the Office of Arts and Culture who are here, Ashley Hassan and Rafa, and Toronto probably stepped out as well, and the folks who are on hand making sure that you all can have a safe and, and, and great stay during this symposium. Um, I want to thank you, David, for inviting me uh, to provide a few words. You mentioned feeling, uh, that feeling of belonging, and I share in that. I'm wearing my Haiti hat today because there are often times in these conversations about Latino culture and Latin America where Haiti left out, when really, Haiti, the first country in Latin America to gain independence, and the first republic to be born out of a slave revolt. So I want to shout out to be sure to, 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 to big up my people. And I'm really grateful to get to share this space with you all. It's always an honor to be in a room with people that get it. I heard lots of call outs earlier, made me feel like I'm at home. Um, and you guys get it. You understand the importance of art, not just as a source of inspiration, but as a vital component of community development and community well-being. So we're not in a room of strangers uh, in that sense. Uh, in the vein of the theme of this art symposium, sustainable arts ecosystem is one of the six priorities of community in our Dallas Cultural Plan and Policy. Um, that part of the plan calls for us to model sustainability to the arts and culture community through our facilities, such as this one, um, and encourage and support the development of future sustainability in the broader arts and cultural sector. Um, there's an equity statement in the Dallas Cultural Plan, and that statement suggests that we'll be renegotiating the operating agreements that we have uh, with some of the city's largest cultural facilities in order to release more resources 
for equitable distribution and use of city facilities, such as this one, in more efficient and equitable ways. Um, in my role as director, I have the privilege and the honor to support this arts ecosystem here in the city of Dallas. And I'm really thankful for the commitment of all of our various stakeholders who help us sustain this ecosystem. Many of you are present here today. So thank you not only for being here physically today, but always for showing up when we call, when we ask, and when we need your advice and your guidance to that end. Uh, I want to help remind you all that um, as you attend the session throughout this symposium, in your swag bag you have a journal. Um, and I'm going to invite you to write your intentions in your journal that you received uh, as your thoughts relate to these following questions that you should reflect on. Uh, one of those questions is, how are you showing up for yourself? You dash yourself that way, show up. How are you showing up for yourself? Secondly, how are you going to continue to show up for your community? As I mentioned, this is not a room of strangers, so I know many of you are already doing that work, um, but moving forward, how do you plan to continue to show up for the community? And thirdly, here, uh, while we're sharing space and time together, what do you want to learn? Again, I invite you to write your intentions and responses <coughs> of the journal that you received. And keep them at the forefront of your mind as you move through the session. Building a sustainable arts ecosystem takes more than any one person, <coughs> any one organization, or even the sum of our individual efforts. It takes much, much more than that. It's all about how we work together, how we support, specifically here, the arts, leveraging every resource at our disposal to create something that lasts. Being able to support our art scene in Dallas has been quite rewarding. I'm almost two years old in that work, and I feel 20 <laughs> already. Uh, but, I, but again, I'm honored, honored to do it, uh, and specifically honored uh, to support Caribbean Theater, one of two Latinx uh, theater companies that call the Latino Cultural Center home making the LCC the first municipal arts building in the nation to house two uh, such theater companies. And that's something we're really proud of. And I hope, David, you understand our commitment to make it right so we can keep it tight. <laughs> okay. Um, I challenge each of you here, um, uh, as you're attending this symposium, to lead with the lens of envisioning your impact and if you represent an organization, uh, the, the impact of your organization as well. Um, I invite you to be open to the creative solutions that will help you uh, and your organizations continue to enrich the lives of those you touch, uh, continue to enrich the fabric of the communities that you serve. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time today. I'm really honored to be in the presence of rooters. <coughs> I wouldn't be here uh, without without many rooters that have uh, served in advisory and guidance for me in my career. Really, 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 really. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, thank y'all for your time today. It's always an honor. I love you. I hope you enjoy yourself and take care of each other while you. Thank you, Marcine. Um, and thank you all for a wonderful afternoon. Um, I just want to make a couple announcements. Uh, so we're going to head out uh, for dinner, and if you would like to have dinner with the folks here, with the artists, with with, uh, with us. Um, there's, din there's still dinner tickets available. You know, it's not available online, but we have a QR code if you would like to have dinner with us. And then um, also, if you have not checked in for tickets to see Resonancias by Asi, which performed earlier today, the dance theater performance uh, just left uh, the box office mill on the way out. Um, and then, of course, tomorrow we're at the Dallas Morning News Campus. And uh, if, if you haven't registered um, officially with, for the symposium, please register. Um, uh, the, art, the, guest, uh, the guest artists from, uh, for the festival are, are automatically registered. But if you have just showed up today, which we absolutely love, and you want to come tomorrow, please let us know because we need to put you on the security list. But, um, but again, if anyone wants to join the symposium, you do it, and it's for free. You just let us know and we'll get you in, but we've got to get you on the, um, the, the guest list for tomorrow before uh, the morning. Um, so 
this uh, today and today the last day are really shrouded in art because that's why we're here. Um, we began with Frederick Sanders' Convergence Suite, and then Asik's um, The First Embrace, and then um, we have a commissioned poet, one of my favorites. And we're going to close this afternoon um, with uh, a commissioned piece by Lyric J.
are in the hands that built this land long before it was divided, Mario confided. They are in the roots of the trees that shelter us. They are, they are folded in forgiveness. We give to better us. You come with war and heart. We come peaceful. You right, we really not easy. My papers are in the rivers that flow with the memories of my people. The officer crossed his arms, still skeptical. You making me mad and I need to see your papers, boy. Mario looked him in the eye, his resolve firm. There is only a holy witness to my existence and if you can't see it, you need spiritual assistance and you need to explain your admissions. How did you get here, sir? Silence hung in the air, heavy with history and truth. The officer realized Mario is one of the fruits of a people with deep roots. He glanced at the ground, his posture softened, and in that moment, the lines between their worlds blurred, and for a heartbeat, they were just two souls sharing the same earth. Mario said, I don't have paperwork to show that I am a child of God, nor a map to prove that this land was my ancestors' land before it was yours. So don't ask me for my papers, sir, when I don't ask you for yours. Thank you for letting me know. Thank you, Leonard Drake. Thank you, artists. Thank you, our professionals of Dallas. See you tomorrow. Let us know if we can sign you up, or we'll see you later. Take care. Have a good one.